With almost uh, three million people unemployed, there's hardly a family in the land that isn't thinking, will we be next? So, what a smart idea to take out one of those loan protection schemes. You know the sort of thing, an insurance policy that covers some of your financial commitments when things go wrong. At least, they sound like a good idea. But some of Britain's jobless have found out that protection is the last thing these policies offered them. Daniel Donoher now reports. This loan will cost me a fortune, but I've got a good job and I'll pay it back bit by bit. Maybe I should take the broker's advice and take out that loan protection insurance he's offering for just an extra few pounds a month, just in case anything happens. Always better to be on the safe side. Loan protection insurance sounds like a good idea, common sense really. If the worst happens and you find yourself out of a job or too ill to work, you can be sure that at least the loan repayments will be kept up. For an extra premium, you can buy peace of mind. Or can you? An increasing number of policyholders who've tried to claim have been shattered as insurance companies tell them they've never been covered. One family in Telford thought they'd done the right thing when they insured a second mortgage four years ago. Uh, my husband applied for the loan because he wanted home improvements that we couldn't afford to do ourselves. We had double glazing installed, extension built on the house. We bought extra land at the back. I'm a believer in insurance, you know, insuring things that are worthwhile to be insured to safeguard yourself. And we thought the insurance policy would safeguard us, you know, in the future. We were told it would. Peter and Joy Gosling arranged their £20,000 loan through a broker who also sold them a loan protection policy. <laughs> that insurance cost £3,400, working out at about £50 a month extra for a policy they thought covered them for redundancy, sickness and accident. Sickness is a verity, and you know, you just don't go sick. Um, I've never had an accident in my life, but the redundancy was important to cover us. I mean, at that particular time when they took the loan out and the insurance, there was ample work available. For 30 years, Peter had earned his living as a self-employed bricklayer. For four years, he'd had regular work from a local builder in Shropshire. Then the recession hit the building trade, and in late 1990, Peter was laid off. With no other work available and no money coming in, Peter turned to his insurers to meet the repayments on his second mortgage. We just went through the normal procedure to sign on, um, claim our unemployment benefit, and to make this claim for redundancy from the insurance company, only to be told that we weren't eligible for it by the fact that we were self-employed. The Goslings argue that the policy small print shows that the self-employed were eligible to join. But when it came to Peter's claim, the insurers told him... The self-employed are excluded from claiming redundancy benefit. Peter's policy was only good for sickness and accident cover. As for redundancy, they were on their own. And we expected to be covered by the policy. But then when we told that there's no way you could claim, we were just absolutely desperate, dumbfounded. We didn't know what to do. Although the payments on the original mortgage were being met by a separate policy from the Goslings soon got into arrears on their second mortgage. The loan company moved to repossess their home last year, but have agreed to wait for the outcome of the family's legal battle with the insurer over the small print of the policy. Well, I've lived here for 17 years. Uh, I've got four children. They've all been brought up here. There's so many memories here. They, you know, this is our home. And to think that somebody else is going to walk in and take it and say it's theirs, I just can't, I can't come to grips with it. I couldn't imagine living anywhere else. And at the time when Pete came home and told me that we'd been repossessed, I said over my dead body. When watchdog asked about the case, they told us that as it was now going to court, they couldn't comment. But in a letter to the Gosling's MP last year, the insurance company argued that Mr. Gosling had received a brochure explaining that the policy excluded the self-employed from redundancy benefit. Peter Gosling says he never saw the brochure until after he'd made the claim. Up to then, he'd assumed he was covered for all eventualities. That assumption has cost him dearly. 
the Goslings aren't the only ones who feel they've been caught out. I decided to buy a Ford Escort, uh, which I thought was a nice little family running around, basically, to get me to work and for the wife to go and fetch the kids from school, etc. The salesman convinced me to uh, actually take out the payment protection plan because he said, basically, in the uh, present climate, you never know when you could have made it redundant or you're ill from work. When he bought the car in May 1990, Tony borrowed £5,000 on the garage's own credit scheme. The added loan protection provided once again by <laughs> cost an extra £800. That worked out as £16 a month on top of his car repayments. At the time, Tony was working as an engineer in a local company. Not long after, he moved on to contract work with several firms at nearby collieries. He was in continuous employment for two years, but then, last October, redundancy struck in a very public way. 30,000 miners are to lose their jobs as British coal closes 31 pits. Its chairman said it was a sad day and blamed competition from gas and nuclear power. I turned up for work on the Thursday night, which the announcement for the pit closure was on the Tuesday night, and I was turned away from work saying, you know, you're no longer employed here. With no income and no immediate prospect of any other work, Tony realised he wouldn't be able to pay off his car loan. Grateful now that he had taken out the loan protection policy, Tony contacted his insurance company, only to be told... You are not in continuous employment with the same or associated employer for at least six months. You are not entitled to benefit. Although he'd never missed a single payment, Tony's short-term contract work did not qualify him as permanently employed, so he wasn't covered. He says he knew nothing about this exclusion. Now I feel that I've been totally ripped off because I've been paying for a plan for two years plus and it's just been a waste of time. You know, I mean, I've been paying £16 for nothing each month. Another look at the small print revealed that Tony should never have been sold the policy in the first place. When I actually signed up for the car, I'd only been working at the firm for three months. So on one hand, they quote in, uh, I've got to be in employment for six months. But actually, when they signed me up for the plan, I'd only been working for three months. So I should never have been sold the plan in the first place. You know, I've been paying for the car two and a half years. I paid well over £4,000 already for it, and uh, I'm going to end up with no car. No nothing. Watchdog asked about Tony Dorsey's case. They told us... His finance arrangement has been rescheduled without insurance, and a refund of his premiums has been arranged. But even with his premiums back, Tony Dorsey could still have his car repossessed, something he thought he'd avoid by paying for insurance cover in the first place. Those on short-term contracts like Tony Dorsey and the self-employed like Peter Gosling aren't the only groups to be excluded under many policies. Karen Holder lost her job last year but <laughs> able to refuse to pay her mortgage because she happened to be pregnant at the time and therefore wasn't classed as available for work. Christine Penzer from Walsall had her claim for redundancy payment turned down by the because she'd only worked for 14 hours a week, not enough to qualify under the policy. People on training courses, student nurses and carers based at home have also had their claims rejected. With so many people falling foul of the exclusion clauses, it's not surprising that the insurers are getting the reputation for being the companies who like to say no. Complaints about loan protection schemes have doubled over the past two years, and it's here at the office of the insurance ombudsman where many end up. How is it then that so many mistakes are being made? These policies were marketed generally and drafted and conceived at a time when recession of the sort we're in now uh, with mass redundancies uh, wasn't uh, foreseen uh, and they're not perhaps as sharp as they should be in their terms. There is a code of practice drafted by the Association of British Insurers that's supposed to govern uh, the selling of this sort of insurance. And it does require the person selling the insurance to make sure that it's suitable to the circumstances of the particular person and to explain the scope of the cover and draw attention to exclusions.
Our experience is this doesn't actually happen ever in relation to loan protection insurance. Perhaps I should say rarely, if ever. The Goslings certainly feel that their ill-fated policy wasn't the right one for their needs. A plan they thought promised peace of mind has done nothing except left them feeling bitter. If anyone is going out for uh, cover for insurance, especially for redundancy, be very, very careful what you're taking out. Get someone else to check it to read the small print. Don't believe what the brokers tell you. We did, and look where it's got us. Tell us they do all they can to ensure the public receive clear and straightforward guidance about their policies. But generally, difficulties like these arise when plans are sold to the customer by a broker or agent. Perhaps the Association of British Insurers should consider this in their current review of the Code of Conduct for sellers of insurance, so that in future, policyholders won't suffer the same fate as Tony and the Goslings. Alice, time for some more calls. What have we got?